This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Get two months of free access to over 25,000 courses by visiting the link in the description. Cities in the United States are known for their rigid gridiron pattern. You can see this in cities like New York, Chicago, and San Francisco. It was the way city streets were planned for over a century. But that changed in the 1930s and 1940s as new development came with a new street pattern, loops and cul-de-sacs. New neighborhoods barely connected to one another either. This street pattern became one of the defining characteristics of urban sprawl. Why did we change how we designed our street networks? Ever since the land ordinance of 1785, the United States embraced the grid. The law divided much of the United States into square mile grid cells, and later acts extended the grid all the way to the Pacific. Cities followed suit, either using those national grids as a starting point or designing their own grid, often to match local topographic and geographic features. Grids made it easy to subdivide and sell land, perfect for a rapidly expanding country. I have a whole video on this topic of grids if you want to go check it out. If grids were so great, why did we switch to the disconnected networks we build now? Well, for one thing, we didn't switch all at once. There was a brief transition period from about 1900 to 1930. Those dates correspond to the growth and development of the automobile, as well as when the streetcars were most popular. Streetcar suburbs were typically laid out in the same grid pattern that made land speculation so easy. It also made it easy for people to walk to nearby streetcar stops. But as cars became more popular, real estate developers could design neighborhoods, often referred to as subdivisions, that didn't need to be near streetcar stops. These new subdivisions could also be smaller, as they didn't have to pay for the cost of a streetcar line. What you got were smaller, more irregular subdivisions in odd places. The roads in these subdivisions would often not connect to each other, and the road networks were often not as well thought out. Cities at the time didn't have any way of forcing developers to design better street systems or cooperate with each other. The federal government eventually drafted a standard City Planning Enabling Act in 1928 that states adopted. These rules allowed cities to adopt citywide street plans and regulate the design of subdivisions. So that tells us why we moved away from the grid, but it doesn't tell us how we got to the loops and the cul-de-sacs of today. Most subdivision regulations found in cities don't explicitly say that new residential areas have to have loops and cul-de-sacs. So what happened next? The Great Depression happened. Suddenly, you had a lot of people who needed affordable housing and a shaky banking system that was often unwilling or unable to make loans to home buyers and housing developers. This is where the federal government stepped in and created the Federal Housing Administration. The FHA would underwrite the loans of new housing developments, making the investment less of a risk to bankers. But they would only underwrite sound investments, and they considered the design of the subdivision when making that determination. This put the FHA in a position of significant power over suburban residential design. Developers didn't put up a fight and went along with the FHA subdivision design recommendations. So what did they recommend? The hot new planning trend at the time was called the neighborhood unit. Here's a sample neighborhood. The basic features of the neighborhood unit are a size that matches the attendance boundary for an elementary school, located at the center of the neighborhood, busy streets at the edges, with no through traffic in smaller neighborhood streets, shops located on the edges along busy streets, with libraries and parks on the interior, no gridiron, but instead streets designed to connect to places where people wanted to go. You can sort of see how the neighborhood unit gets us closer to suburban sprawl street patterns. Imagine strip malls along those suburban arterial streets. Real estate developers designed their subdivisions according to neighborhood unit principles to get the funding they needed for their housing. The result was a lot of disconnected networks that didn't connect the way they used to with the grids. But this doesn't explain cul-de-sacs. Where did they come from? Cul-de-sacs first made an appearance in the Garden Cities era from about 1900 to 1935. They were designed as a refuge from streets that were increasingly full of loud, fast-moving cars. Street patterns with a lot of cul-de-sacs used less asphalt and concrete, which saved developers money. And because they only handled local traffic, cul-de-sacs could be narrower, another win for developers. Despite the benefits of cul-de-sacs and their use in some influential Garden City projects, it took a while for them to catch on. They weren't even prominently used in example neighborhood unit communities. Their popularity comes from a pretty mundane source, engineering design standards. Transportation engineering emerged as a separate field from civil engineering in the 1920s, and in 1931, 30 engineers got together to form the Institute of Transportation Engineers. This organization is notable for publishing design standards for the road building industry. They became the design manuals engineers grabbed when they laid out subdivisions. The ITE, in its 1965 publication, Recommended Practice for Subdivision Streets, recommended that subdivisions should discourage through traffic, four-way intersections should be avoided in favor of T-intersections, curvilinear patterns, loops, and cul-de-sacs should be used to encourage slow-moving traffic. 
T intersections were encouraged because of an engineering study that compared crash rates between gridded neighborhoods and FHA neighborhood unit neighborhoods. The study found that there were almost eight times the crashes in gridded networks. They also found that T intersections had no crashes at all. They concluded that for safety's sake, neighborhoods should be full of cul-de-sacs, T intersections, and convoluted street patterns. The subsequent updates through 1990 did little to change these recommendations. The period between the first publication in 1965 and 1990 saw a huge residential building boom in the United States, and engineers at the time used those ITE standards. So that's how we got from the gridded streets of the 19th century to the disconnected mess of today. This is primarily a result of the institutionalization of street design standards, first by the federal government, then by industry organizations. Once something becomes standard practice, it's really hard to change. Now you may have noticed in this video I talk about these disconnected street patterns with somewhat of a negative tone. And that's because building streets like this makes it really hard to use any kind of transportation option besides a car. Circuitous streets make walking and biking trips longer, which can discourage people from doing that at all. Grids are far more flexible. You can turn grids into cul-de-sacs, but it's a lot harder to take down houses to turn cul-de-sacs into grids. Thankfully, cities have begun to rethink their subdivision street design standards, and we're seeing networks with more connections for pedestrians and cyclists. The next phase of residential street design could be some sort of hybrid, where cul-de-sacs still exist because people love to live on them, but there are paths for other modes. Some places already have these path systems, and it's something we could see more of in the future. So the set behind me is pretty new. It's certainly better than when I started and I was talking in front of a blue sheet at a table. I've come a long way. When I was thinking about how to redesign the set, I turned to longtime friend of the channel, Skillshare. The great thing about Skillshare is they have so many good courses, they've got something for seemingly every situation. I've used them to improve my videos audio and animation, and even how to interpret art. Now I'm using Skillshare to learn about the principles of interior design using this really well done course. I honestly like doing Skillshare ads because it's been a useful service to me. With more than 25,000 courses in business, design, technology, and more, it's bound to be useful for you too. Go sign up at the link in the description and get two months of Skillshare Premium for free. If you want to keep using Skillshare, a premium subscription is less than $10 a month. That's a great deal. Signing up also helps support this channel, so please consider it. 